Hi there, and welcome to the Grief and Rebirth podcast. I'm your host, author and trauma survivor, Irene Weinberg, here to encourage you wherever you are in your healing journey. In each episode, I chat with incredible grief and trauma specialists, healers, mediums, and celebs, as well as remarkable people who have inspiring healing stories to share. If you're looking for a podcast that's both uplifting and inspiring, you've found it. Let us help you find your joy in life. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you today from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey, and I could not be more delighted to have this opportunity to interview Stephen Berkeley, who is a writer, a director, a producer, and a filmmaker who will be speaking to us today from Connecticut. Stephen has worked in multiple capacities inside the entertainment media industry for over 30 years. Today, Stephen and I will be talking about his first fully self-produced PBS feature film titled Life with Ghosts, which is a Best Documentary Film Festival winner. Inspired, when Stephen's father transitioned and his mother began reporting interactions with his father's ghost, the documentary is the culmination of a seven-year investigation into the nature of love, loss, and ghosts. It features three survivors' quests for answers to questions such as, are ghosts a real phenomenon, or are they merely symptomatic of profound grief? Life with Ghosts heralds a welcome alternative to traditional talk therapy and prescription drug use for the chronically bereaved. The film records the first ever publicly funded attempt to facilitate contact with deceased individuals to determine if such contact can be used to re reduce severe grief symptoms. In the documentary, a widow suffering prolonged grief agrees to participate in a research study that aims to reconnect bereaved survivors with their departed loved ones through a process known as induced after-death communication, also known as IADC, which is rapidly gaining recognition among psychologists, academics, and bereavement professionals. Full disclosure, I have seen Life with Ghosts twice. I absolutely loved it, and I resonated with it. And I am also a big fan of Stephen's Life with Ghosts Let's Chat interviews on YouTube. I'm looking forward to talking with Stephen about how he was inspired to make Life with Ghosts after his father's death sent his mother into a tailspin. What is induced after-death communication and how it helps to heal grief? Why Stephen used the word ghosts in his title. Why life is about discovering your true nature. How automatic writing works and so much more for what is going to be a fascinating, insights-filled and enlightening interview that will surely ignite a desire within you to see Stephen's groundbreaking documentary, Life with Ghosts. Hey, Stephen. A warm, truly heartfelt welcome to Grief and Rebirth Podcast. Hi, Irene. Thank you so much for inviting me to this. And I loved your introduction. <laughs> I think I might want to use that in the future. You can cheat. I provide <laughs> cheat sheets. <laughs> well, you're all of what I said. And I really like letting our Grief and Rebirth Podcast audience know how special the people are who I'm interviewing and your bona fides, why you know of what you speak. Um, and, and we're going to enlighten a lot of people. I mean, your, your documentary is absolutely wonderful and it's courageous. And um, like when I first came out with my book, I'm sure a lot of people were going, are you crazy? Right. And uh, all of that. And, and um, we're in the front of a growing wave of people who are becoming more and more aware so let's let's get them even more aware. Let me start to ask you about all this. And the first thing I'd love to ask is about your background. So, I mean, you you lost your dad. Yes. Your mom went into a tailspin mm -hmm. and nothing helped her. 
until her neighbor, Ethel, suggested automatic writing. So could you tell us about that and kind of tell our audience what is automatic writing also and how it helped your mother to start to connect with your dad? Sure. What happened was when my dad died, like you said, my mother was completely lost. She, she was she was disoriented. She had been with him for half a century and suddenly he was gone. I didn't realize that grief in a, of itself is a kind of trauma. I didn't know about that aspect of it. I just knew that my mother wasn't functioning and I didn't know what to do. My siblings and I all flew down to Florida where she and my father were living. We did everything we thought we were supposed to do, grief support, uh, uh, grief counseling, uh, support groups like the circles, religious services, everything that we're taught we we're supposed to do for the bereaved and nothing had any impact. Wow. Luckily, Ethel, the little old neighbor, neighbor, Ethel, little old lady neighbor, Ethel came over to the house and said, Irene, we don't talk about this a whole lot, but there's something I do with my husband, my late husband that helps me. I write to him. I write to him every night. It really helps me. And then she leaned in real close to my mother and said, at a I say that again, and and he writes back. Oh she my. said in a hushed tone. So, my mother did not know what to make of this. My brothers and I, my none of us knew what to do with this information. Um, I would say, for the most part, my mother was kind of like she was disturbed by it. She had not even buried my father yet, and here's Ethel saying, "He let me let me get you in touch with him." So. My mother kind of threw her Ethel out of the house. I was interested in Ethel, not because I necessarily believed in what she was doing. I assumed she was schizophrenic. But there was something about what she was saying and what she was doing that seemed really interesting to me. I was not a spiritualist. I was just, I'm open. I'm open to things. And Ethel intrigued me. I followed her over to her house where she proceeded to show me a stack of yellow legal pads and on those yellow legal pads, she explained, were her conversations with her late husband over a 12-year period via automatic writing. I was like, wow, Ethel doesn't look insane, but of course she must be, right? But the more I got to know her and question her, I realized, wow, she might be one of the most grounded, pleasant, interesting, innately smart people I've ever met. How could she be this insane and also be presenting as somewhat like a rational person. So that inspired me to do a little bit of research. But the first thing I wanted to do is just tell my mom, listen to Ethel. She seems to be happy. Whatever she's doing is working for her. So kind of suspend your disbelief for at least a little bit and see if you could try what she's suggesting. And just getting back to your question, automatic writing basically is getting into kind of a, a state where you're, you could basically let thoughts into your head. When you write, writing in of itself, I'm not explaining this well, but I'm doing, I'll do my best. When you write, that's an, I think it's called an idiomotor response. We're so used to forming the letters post-kindergarten that we kind of don't think consciously about what we're writing. So if we just start to write on a piece of paper, hey, husband, are you around? And then we kind of answer for him, let's say, to start start him off. Then somewhere along the line, thoughts start coming into your head that seem like they are from the person you're writing to. At first, you think it's just you. But then at some point, you'll realize, wait, this is actually something I wouldn't think of, but my husband or my wife or my parent would. So that's what automatic writing is. I don't know if I've explained that well. No, but, but that sounds like, yeah, I think you. I think that's a really good um, way for people because I've never heard it spoken about where you can actually start them off. And I think that's a really um, great way to do that. And it gets you kind of in a frame. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the message, when you hear it, comes through very quickly. They they communicate very, very quickly. Instantly, yes. Instantly, which yeah. like if you take your time, that's not your, that's your thought. It's not the one that immediately comes mm -hmm. in. And how did Ethel's story, so, Eth, so now you're learning about automatic writing and what do you do? You walk home to your mother and go, oh, I think you're going to make a documentary about this. How did that evolve? I just said to my, I said to my mom, first I said, <laughs> mom, I think Ethel might be insane, but she's happy. Why don't you just try this because it seems to be working. 
And she, you know, bless her heart. She was like, okay, you know, I'll give it a try. I will try writing to your father. And so she did that. And that did not work for her because it takes a lot of practice. It takes kind of, I mean, if you write it, read a book on automatic writing, and there's a couple of now I could recommend, but they pretty much say, do it every day for 30 days straight. Sit down with a piece of paper, write to your loved one, so-and-so, are you here? And just wait or start them off with something that they might say and just kind of try to get into a, a rhythm. So my mother did not have patience for that. So that didn't really work for her, but she ended up kind of consulting Ethel privately and just saying, just help me connect. And Ethel did that. That's wonderful. So Ethel became a conduit for your mother. which Yeah, is she was like marvelous. a medium, yeah. Yeah, like just like a medium. So now let's talk about this concept because your documentary talks about induced after-death communication. So the first way, need, and it's gaining recognition among yes. psychologists, academics, and bereavement professionals. So we need you to describe it, Pete, Stephen, and explain how it helps people who are dealing with prolonged grief disorder. I will describe it, but just to go in um, chronological order, I want to tell you how I found induced after death communication. Please do, therapy. please do. So I decided at some point that I wanted to film what was going on with my mother and with Ethel because they were two cute little old ladies that were friends and neighbors and they were experiencing grief very differently. One was on top of the world, one was in terrible despair. And I thought just by juxtaposing them, there was something to be learned from this. I didn't want to necessarily preach any kind of method of getting through grief. I just wanted to capture these two women and let the audience decide for themselves. So I did that. I followed them around. And I followed my, I followed my mother to her grief counselor therapy session. And in that session, my mother just kind of launched into, hey, you know, my neighbor does this crazy kooky thing regarding automatic writing, should I try that to help me through it? And the grief counselor was very discouraging. She said, Irene, that's a long, that's a- Oh, by the way, everyone, her, his mother's name is Irene, that's his mind. Yes, so he's my mother's his... name is Irene. <laughs> and my mother is in the film. And, my, and the grief counselor said to my mother, that sounds like a short-term solution to a long-term problem. That's not the way out of grief. I didn't know anything about anything regarding after death communication but i knew just kind of intuitively that here's this 80 something year old woman who's looking for some salvation and she's finding a glimpse of hope in this concept of autom of uh, automatic writing or just communicating with the dead in general why would this grief counselor be disabusing my mother of this notion even if it was like a placebo effect my mother was looking for why at this stage of her life why should she be talked out of that? So it made me a little bit, it made me a little bit defiant is how I felt. And I felt, you know what? This is more than a cute little documentary about these two little old ladies having different experiences in grief. This is about a disconnect in our society because I knew that there was some research that had to do with the continuing bonds theory with people actually getting better and improving from the grief with the belief that they are in contact still with their beloved. So I knew enough to know that I had a reason to kind of expand the picture. And to get back to your question about IADC, what happened was one of the subjects of the film turned out to be Ethel's estranged daughter-in-law. Because I asked all the topics, all I was following a lot of different widows and widowers before making the film. And then, and then filming them and then asking who else do they know that just lost a spouse? Because at first it was just about, actually it ended up being just about spouses. I was only interested in people who lost their spouses at the time. And I said, so, so tell me, do you know anybody? And Ethel turned me on to her estranged daughter-in-law who was willing to do an interview. And also Karen's kids were willing to do an interview. So I interviewed them and just like I do with everybody who was in the film, I, I distributed information that I was learning about how to get through bereavement because I felt like that was my responsibility. I was learning new things. Let me tell all the people in the film how what, what other people have tried and been successful at doing. And one of the things that the daughters found was something called IADC, which stands for Induced After Death Communication Therapy. So you actually, because you show that in the documentary 
of one of the daughters discovering that. Yes. Oh, and so that's very much based on fact. That, that there was only the the story. This film has no recreations except for that one scene because we were not there when she was actually found that research. So we just had her do research right, on her computer right. again. But that's right. She found on her own. Well, we we provided it. We kind of led her there to some degree. But she found this induced after death communication therapy. She liked it. And what it is is this. Most people know what EMDR is, and for those of your audience who don't know, it's eye movement desensitization but, it reprogramming. And, re, but, eye movement I, desensitization reprogramming. Reprocessing. I've experienced it, so that's how I know. What that eye is. movement desensitization and reprocessing. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. So the founder of this IAD therapy was in the 1990s, was a, a, in the a Chicago Veterans Hospital administering EMDR to some Vietnam vets. And one of them had a spontaneous after-death communication in the session. So the psychologist that was administering this EMDR said, hmm, this is strange. This has never happened before. Let me try this again. He did something a little bit different. He, he customized EMDR just a little bit differently than what was standard. And he wanted to know if what happened in his session to, pro to prompt an after-death communication, if that could be repeated. And he was able to do that. He was able to repeat it. And he said, wow, if I take EMDR and just make these couple of tweaks, I'm able to repeat people having spontaneous after-death communications. I guess it's not spontaneous anymore because I'm doing something. I'm facilitating something and it's working. So he got very excited. He did a lot more research. He wrote a book called Induced After-Death Communication. And... Which I have, by the way, his name is Alan Botkin. Right? Alan Botkin is his name, yes. And he put it, he, it was different enough from EMDR, which he felt comfortable putting his name on it as the founder of this induced after death communication therapy. Of course, everything is built on the shoulders of other others. Sure. So, but so, so this is what happened. And this got, and, but you know, it's funny when I made the movie, nobody knew what this therapy was because. He's a psychologist. He's a very good psychologist, but he himself will admit he's not a good marketer. So he was had trouble getting the word out that this therapy was available. But when these girls found it, Karen's daughters found it, and they decided to get me to get her mother into this therapy and have me film it, then everybody was on board and, and it was time to like spread the news. And what is really cool is Karen really didn't know for herself it was, if it was going to work. Right. And the movie is very um, positive and graphic about how it really did help her. And I want to tell you just a validated experience that I had because when I had my spiritual awakening and I was getting messages for my book and all, I was in therapy and my therapist thought that I was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and she was trying to discourage me from all of this. And... Uh, I knew so much that something something real had happened to me and she couldn't resonate with it. I stopped seeing her and I ended up going to someone else because she was not validating my reality. She was, it's the same thing. She was acting like, and now I must say through this podcast, many psychotherapists have commented to me that this is helping them to open up to this additional way for people to mm -hmm. process their grief and get help with their grief, which leads me to asking you, um, I know IADC has been tested at the University of North Texas with jaw-dropping results that put your documentary on the map, correct? And have there been other studies? You want to talk about that? And have there been other studies you'd like to tell us about? Because this is a real, real thing. It is a real thing. Well, one of the most exciting studies that I came across in my research for the film is something that also happened at the University of North Texas. There's a researcher there named Jenny Streithorn, and she reviewed, I believe, 35 studies published on after-death communication spanning like 112 years. Wow. And, it, and that involved 50,000 people and 24 countries. Wow. And she found in just crunching the numbers, taking a very objective viewpoint of all of this, she found that 75% of people report one or more communications from their deceased 
in the first year following the death. So we're hearing from ghosts routinely. Now, you might, a lot of people come back and say, well, that's a grief-induced hallucination. Well, I have, I have a response to that. Hallucinations are, it's a clinical term, and it's a very specific de definition. First off, there are different quality to it, right? They, hallucinations are usually fairly, they feel ephemeral. They usually are fairly distressing in nature, and, they, and the memory kind of fades quickly. An after-death communication, as we're calling it, a post-mortem visit, another way to, think to, way to call it something, they are, feel very, very real to the experiencer. They are remembered distinctly by the experiencer, usually over a lifetime, and it's usually a very pleasant experience. So just the quality of this means that it should not fall under the same definition of hallucination. We need another term for something that we can't, doesn't, it's not really in our physical reality, but to the experiencers, to the 75% of all people who have had a loss, to those people, we need a new term for that. And by people referring to it as a hallucination is another way of just saying it's not real. It's right. another way of suppressing what it is. So your term for it is? Well, I, I call them post-mortem visits. Post-mortem visits. But um, I think it's just- It's amazing. It's wonderful because when people learn this technique, they really, I mean, they can certainly still go to mediums who are wonderful, but then way they can get their own messages too. Yes. From their deceased loved one. Precisely. But by the way, I wanted to make sure when I put out this film that I wasn't just touting one particular therapy. I think IEDC is the coolest thing in the world. It's new. It's exciting. But in five years, there might be another way to connect that's even more exciting. So I wanted to make sure I was very conscious of the fact and very deliberate in making the film that this was about continuing a bond, whether it's through mediumship, automatic writing, IEDC therapy. It doesn't really matter. If people feel they have permission without being accused of being an idiot, if people have the, feel they have permission to reach out to their loved ones across the veil, then they'll do so and they'll be healthier for it. Because what we found, what Dennis Class and his fellow colleagues found when writing Continuing Bonds, is they found that, hey, this is just healthier for us. We, op we, we operate much better in the world when we take our loved ones with us. So right. why not? Why, why, why not? should we deprive? Our nervous systems don't know the difference between having making time for our friends in, in life and making time for our, our loved, loved ones, ones in spirit. And by the way, we know the more that we learn that our loved ones are all around us. They've only discarded their bodies. They left the body. They left their earth suit and they're all around us. So why wouldn't they be looking for ways to communicate with us? They have right. they still have plenty to say. They retain their personalities on the other side. Some of them are, you know, doing their own healing there, which I could go on and on about that, but not now, but you know, they, uh, many of them go across and they've been, had trauma and all, and they continue to heal. Why wouldn't they want right. to communicate with you? They're all around. So I also have been struck because I've been listening to your podcast and you had someone talking about how um, IADC as a therapeutic intervention for grief is in some ways even more effective than talk therapy. No offense to all the therapists listening to us, but maybe it's something that they want to incorporate in their practices it, because in just two sessions, it can accomplish a lot for a person. Is that true? Would you like to speak to that? Yes. According to my research, and I'm sure there are people who have other, other sources and would counter this with their own research, but according to my research, talk therapy doesn't work on grief. I mean, I, I think some people actually end up at least in the uh, in the University of North Texas study, the there were two they were comparing the grief counseling, traditional grief counseling to the IADC, and some people actually got worse with talk wow. therapy. So, statistically speaking, grief therapy does not work. IADC has a success rate of eighty percent. 
80% of people who go through IEDC therapy feel better or actually, or actually get a visit, I would say. They actually feel like they get a visit from their deceased loved one. Now, if you speak to a, a therapist candidly, off screen, they will tell you that 100% of the time, the person sitting for IEDC therapy will feel better. They might not get a visit. Not everybody gets a visit, but they will feel like the trauma has been separated from the grief. Now they could think about their beloved, their beloved or their, whether it's a child or, or a parent or a spouse, they could think about them without fall, falling into that pit of despair that people tend to go into. Well, they don't feel as abandoned because now they're learning the person is around them. They just don't have their body. But it's not as much of a, it, they ha, this person hasn't been wiped out forever. Right. Right? They're, they're all around them. So yes. also, I was struck in your documentary by your protagonist, Karen, yeah. who now I'm finding out was the daughter-in-law of Ethel. Um, I'm uh, And she was definitely helped through the IADC. And by the way, the people who administer it are usually therapists, aren't they? And they've learned this new technique, yes. right? You, ha you have to be a licensed therapist or counselor. And yes, they're definitely, it's a, it's a very stringent process to become an L. Uh, so this is okay. a wonderful new modality for a lot of therapists to adopt that can help their clients who are struggling with grief. And how does this work for skeptics? Someone comes to, someone comes and they go, this IADC, BS, you know, whatever. Do they get surprised? I mean, um, is it known to work for skeptics when they come in? Interestingly, Irene, I'm so glad you asked me that question. There's a paradoxical effect, meaning that it works better for skeptics. Wow. The reason why is because expectations block results. So if somebody's so excited to hear about this therapy, they, they go into the therapy room so excited, they're finally going to get to see their late spouse or child or parent. And that, ex that expectation can actually just throw a monkey wrench into the whole thing. Wow, that's really interesting. What is your favorite part of life with ghosts, Stephen? What, like, really lit your jets as you were doing this? <laughs> yeah. All the people I was meeting who were a lot smarter than I than me, and they were believing this, because so for so long, I wasn't really delving into it because I thought people would accuse me of being an idiot. And I think if anybody has seen Dean Radin put out something and it's on YouTube, it's called the, uh, the hypothesis, is it the idiocy, the stupidity, stupidity hypothesis. Have you seen that, Irene? No. It's really great. Dean Radin is a scientist from the Institute of Noetic Sciences. He's like a real scientist. I know that institute. Yep. And he put out a video, a video basically explaining that the stupidity hypothesis says that most people who believe in active communication or ghosts or whatever must be stupid. But if you compare the data of people who believe in after-death communication and people with advanced degrees, it's a positive correlation. The smarter people are believing in more than just this physical reality. So that should give people some permission to at least investigate for themselves, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I know that there was some controversy about the fact that you used the word ghosts in your title for your documentary. What was that about? And you've also experienced some synchronicities that I'm sure our yes. audience will find very interesting. My favorite question is about the title. I, I got so much heat. I got more heat from the title than anything else, else that had to do with the film. Why are you accusing their deceased loved ones of being Casper the Friendly Ghost? <laughs> 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 well, I, I grew up with Casper the Friendly Ghost, so I assumed that was a, a safe title. Also, Patrick Swayze, yeah, exactly. I thought yeah. it came a long way in, in defanging the word ghost. But people, and I, I don't want to say that I can't blame them. I, I, sh I should say I can't blame them because people don't necessarily want to think of their deceased child, for instance, as a ghost. They just don't like that image. And I don't want to say they can't. I, they, I, I feel bad for them, of course. Um, I, I use the term ghost for a couple of reasons. One is that ghost, unlike the word spirit, life with spirits is another possibility, I suppose, even though some people might think I'm talking about alcohol. But spirits doesn't have the connotations that ghost has. Ghost is used metaphorically, figuratively, um, literally. 
it has all these different connotations and i wanted to uh, i wanted to take advantage of that because the widows in the film are are different places of their grief one widow like ethel the automatic writer feels like she's having contact with a phantom she there's a ghost living in her house so that's a ghost is a literal interpretation for her but others in the film like her estranged daughter-in-law or like the irene character who's my mother they are just haunted by the memories of their husbands so ghost works in both instances and if anything i would think it's more of a figurative use because since karen's the protagonist and she's actually more haunted by the memories than anything else in this case the title is a figurative title oh. well i thought it was really great it was a very appropriate and um it's it's it Get someone to, what is his life with ghosts? I think I want to hear that. What, what, what is that all about? Right, it's, it's provocative, right? It's, it's, a, provocative. It's, a, it's, a main, it's a mainstream, it's another reason. It's a mainstream title. I'm trying to attract the mainstream to the film. I don't want to preach to the choir. I want to invite the masses in and let them make a decision as to whether or not it's worth investigating. Yeah, that's really, it's sort of like when I named my book, They Serve Bagels in Heaven. People, oh, do they really? What's that all about? You Fantastic know? Fantastic title. Yeah, really. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank Brilliant. you. <laughs> and they do. Page eight. Anyway, <laughs> I have to get back to you. <laughs> so what do you mean when you say that life is not an immortality project and instead it is a discovery of your true nature? I love that, Stephen. And what are your hopes? Because I know you're hoping that life with ghosts helps to move consciousness on the planet, which is something this podcast is also all about. So would you like to talk about well, that? First of all, bit? I'm pretty sure that was Graham Maxey, somebody was in the film who said that life is not an immortality project <clears throat> because he wrote a book and in his book, he talks about five things he's learned from the dead in administering induced after death communication therapy. And one of them was about ego. Mm. That... Whatever we do in this on this plane to try to pre preserve our name, it doesn't really matter over there. So whatever we think is important here and whatever we do, whatever we're striving for to make money, for recognition, to build ourselves, to build our names, that's just not important when you cross over. You lose that ego. So I think that's what he was referring to when he was talking about life was not an immortality mm -hmm. project. Okay. It should be at least. And certainly your and certainly your documentary moves consciousness on the planet that we know that we go on. <clears throat> and I have been told many times that we get life reviews. And when we get life reviews, they don't give us medals for how much money we made or our right. egos or our name. You get to feel and know how you treated other people. I don't know if you picked up on this, Irene, but I tried really, really hard not to proselytize in the movie. I don't I'm not trying oh, to Oh, you did a good job. Oh, good. I'm not yeah, pushing an agenda. I want to show both sides. I wanted to hear from the debunkers. I wanted to hear from the Oh, you have no idea that you're yes. either way. You don't know that you're that you that you actually subscribe to Good. this mode of Good. no, you did a wonderful job. Yeah. Now in the podcast, Irene, in the podcast, I've decided to kind of come out. Oh yeah. Say, okay, I'm a believer. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the movie, I wanted people to make up their own minds. Right, which is great because so many people will watch it and they want to make up their own minds. They want to see this for themselves. Yeah. And Karen is a very convincing protagonist with with um, what happened to her. Now I know, understand about Ethel. So that that's very cool too. Um, how did, okay, so everyone now is listening to this and I cannot recommend and uh, compliment you more on Life with Ghosts. So, and you also did a TED Talk. So you want to tell us about that and anything you'd like to share with your audience about, help, you know, how do they get Life with Ghosts? How do they see the documentary? Whatever whatever you'd like to say, how do they get a hold of you? Well, you're going to provide a link to your listeners. Right. That will, that will let them go right to where you could get the film. Right now, I'm trying, I'm raising funds for a PBS version. I have to make a 56-minute version of the film. Right now, it's 90 minutes. I have to make a 56 minute version for PBS and that's going to cost quite a bit of money. So I'm trying to raise money for that. And what I'm doing is because the film is still in the film festival circuit and I'm not allowed to show the film publicly, but I'm allowed to raise money and show the film that way. So if you make a small donation towards my PBS premiere, then people will be able to watch the film that way. And, um, You'll, you'll provide them with that link. We'll provide all that information yeah. um, when we release the when this wonderful podcast interview. 
And I really want to say also that the mission of Grief and Rebirth podcast being to educate, enlighten, and bring people healing choices. This is so in line with that. This is such a new modality and a wonderful healing choice. In what ways can grief sometimes crack us open? So, And how do our deceased loved ones teach us? What do they teach us that promotes healing? Do you have any thoughts about that? I have thoughts. I, I I certainly don't feel like I'm in a position of authority because I'm not a medium and I'm not a healer. I'm just basically reporting what other people are doing. But I, I have a feeling about it because I'm, I'm learning all the time as you are. And I'm finding that I'm, I'm getting surprised by things. For one thing, I'm getting surprised by the fact that they're just people still. Yes. They're not necessarily the most enlightened creature in the universe I'm finding, sometimes they had this, the same, they had the same foibles that the rest of us have on earth. And that was interesting to me that they're not just playing a harp on a cloud somewhere. They, they're actually going through their own journeys. They're just in a different yeah. space. Right. So that was really interesting to, to learn about. And it makes, it makes sense to me. Um, how do they crack us open? You know, sometimes they get our attention you know, they'll do something or they'll, they'll send us a message or they'll show us something. And sometimes we can pick up on the message and sometimes we don't. But when, if you're ever in a position where you feel like, wow, I feel like I just got a wink from my late husband or my late child or my late parent. When you feel like you really got that and it's in, undeniable that it's it's too too much of a coincidence that it's not them, that's kind of an open cracking. <laughs> it certainly is. That certainly happened to me. <laughs> and they and they have a lot to teach that promotes healing i i had a very troubled relationship um with my father and he has come through many times through mediums and all to say he's healing on the other side and he acknowledges what he did and he apologizes so talk about and, and at one point in the early stage of when i had just had the accident and i was going through all this he literally said i'm with you and i'm learning so much by hanging around you talk about proof that he was around and at that point i didn't really want him hanging around me you know so yes it does promote healing and stephen tell me about the stephen berkeley tip for finding joy in life <laughs> first of all i love that i'm getting so much credit for being this like you know guy on the mountain um, well, so, you know what? People give me the same credit too. And I say to people, you know, I'm learning along with you and um, whatever I can pass along from what I've learned, I'm really glad to share. Fantastic. Well, I, I feel like what what I've learned for me, and I, again, I don't want to try to convert anybody to, for my way of thinking, um, but what I'm learning is being of service is, is, is gives me a lot of joy. And I feel like it's a way for people to kind of get out of their own heads and their own drama. When you do something kind for another person, when you show them there's a, a roadmap to where they might want to go, that feels great. So in a way, it's selfish of me because I'm doing something that's making me feel great, but it, it does bring me quite a bit of joy, as I'm sure it does for you. I, this, is, this is such a wonderful a vehicle when you're, and when you're in the world and you know that you're helping so many people it just fills me with gratitude yeah i just well. am, i'm very grateful and Stephen, i have gratitude today because i want to thank you for normalizing the healing power of after death communication through your groundbreaking documentary life with ghosts which can dissolve the fear of receiving after death communication help to heal prolonged grief and inspire people to become open to what our deceased loved ones can teach us and may I also add, it can take away the fear of death. My heartfelt thank you, Stephen, for this important and very illuminating interview on Grief and Rebirth podcast. And here's a loving reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. As I like to say, to be continued. Thank you so much, Stephen. Many blessings and bye for now. Mm -hmm.